matter, the most generic term for what physicists study, has become puzzlingly elusive in scientific uh, discourse today. Uh, everything in the cosmos, we are told, consists of matter. But what is that? Some matter, we hear, is ordinary, consisting of atoms. But most of it is dark and is indescribable in the standard model of particle physics. Together with the so-called dark energy of empty space, dark matter accounts for 96% of the world's contents. We can infer its presence from the behaviour of visible matter, but dark matter as such, hence its name, is of unknown composition. Plotinus, the last ancient Greek philosopher of paramount genius, could have sympathised with the philosopher's difficulties in describing and defining matter. Like them, he acknowledged the existence of visible matter, taking its presence to be straightforwardly evident from our experience of ordinary objects like trees, stones and animals, bodily items spatially extended and endowed with qualities that impinge on our senses. If all that we mean by matter is the visible and tangible stuff of which ordinary objects consist, the wood of the bed, the bronze of the spear, the flesh and bones of the animal, there's no linguistic or conceptual problem for Plotinus. But what are we to say or think according to him when we extend the scope of matter beyond ordinary objects? Is there a further matter of which visible and tangible matter in all its variety is ultimately composed? A more or a most primitive feature of the world's makeup? The favoured ancient answer to that question had been affirmative. To wit, a set of four elements comprising earth, air, fire and water. End of story. Well, no, earth, air, fire and water were generally understood to be qualitative terms, each of them referring not to a single homogeneous stuff, water in the sense of H2O, for instance, but to the following set of primary qualities or combinations of qualities, hot, cold, moist and dry, all of which admit of change and degree. Qualities of what, we may ask, to continue the analysis. The favoured answer, the Aristotelian answer, had been matter. Plotinus's problem and its nominal affinity to modern physics can now be stated. In order to serve as the physical foundation of everything, ultimate matter can't be identified with definite or determinate things such as the four elements, for in that case it couldn't serve as their foundation too. Matter as such, or matter simpliciter, to use Aristotelian language, must always be potential and analogical rather than actual, drawing its descriptive identity from that of which it is the matter, for instance the bronze of the spear, the wood of the bed. But bronze and wood or even the four elements of which things like bronze and wood were supposed to consist, aren't ultimate matter, because they have definite form, wooden, brazen, and so on. Is there then any such entity as ultimate matter, if that expression signifies a completely indefinite and indeterminate foundation for things? How can we know that such matter is in any sense real? and not a mere figment or convenience of our conceptual scheme. I want to show how and why Plotinus grapples with these deep issues. He's not willing to say outright that ultimate matter is nothing. Ultimate matter, in his view, is a precondition for the existence of bodies, three-dimensionally extended and perceptible objects. But taken by itself, ultimate matter, according to Plotinus, isn't bodily or physical stuff or anything with determinate quality or quantity. Ultimate matter 
is completely imperceptible and non-actual taken by itself. We know it only by a kind of inference from phenomena. Try as we may to imagine ultimate matter independently of some form, we find ourselves completely in the dark trying to picture the least accessible of the world's contents. And yet, however hard it is to specify, ultimate matter is there and necessary somehow. So much by way of introduction to the issues I'll try to raise in this talk. I've chosen to discuss Plotinus because at this late stage of my life, I find him one of the most challenging and certainly the most difficult of all the Greek philosophers, to whom I was first fully introduced a few yards away from here in the years 1958 to 1960 as a classic student at University College. Plotinus, working on his grand metaphysical scheme in the first decades of the third century of our era, resists dividing the world dualistically into thought and extension or animate and inanimate, or body and spirit. These binary categories are inapt, he postulates, because ultimately everything, according to him, has its source in what he calls everlasting and transcendent unity. There's a rather baffling passage on the handout, text 8, which you may want to kind of look at from time to time. I won't try to explain it now, but it is a sort of trying to present a kind of schematic version of his rather complicated way of carving up the world, starting at the top with what he calls the one, sometimes he calls it God, sometimes he calls it the good, and right at the bottom of this scheme, as we can see, he posits ultimate matter. We'll come to that later, but uh, there is a beginning of that great scheme. For everything that exists, according to Plotinus, there's a corresponding idea derived from unity, or rather existence, by which he means something that's determinate and stable, depends on what can be thought. And here Plotinus echoes Parmenides, one of his most hallowed predecessors, whom he takes correctly, in my opinion, to identify being and thinking. Can ultimate matter be thought? If it cannot, it must exist only in some equivocal sense. Ultimate matter, as envisioned by Plotinus, is equivocal indeed, but it's not an incoherent notion. Its obscurity is essential to the queer role it plays in his metaphysical scheme. I'll now give a brief genealogy of the notions of matter that Plotinus inherited from earlier Greek philosophers. I'll then work through a selection of his statements, which you have on the handout, taking them mainly from his short essay entitled On Matter. I hope this procedure will let me uh, ask in more detail as we go, what's the matter with matter from his stance? In conclusion, I'll ask whether the dark matter of modern physics and the darkness Plotinus attributes to ultimate matter have anything more than a name in common. <coughs> Plotinus begins his essay with the expression, this is text one on the handout, he, uh, what he calls so-called matter. This evasive sounding phrase, so-called, is appropriate because his Greek word, hule, conventionally translated by matter, starts its linguistic life meaning wood or timber. Hence, material is often a better translation. Our English word matter is derived from Latin, materia. In Latin usage, materia, like Greek hule, primarily denotes wood or timber, getting that name from the word mata in the sense of mother mother earth or parent. From the outset then, in Greek philosophy, matter is a metaphorical term, standing generically for what things are made of, for instance wood, and then extended 
signify the ultimate foundation of physical things. The earliest Greek cosmologists did not draw on the term hule, but they operated with comparable metaphors. Empedocles called earth, air, fire and water, which are his pri four primary beings, the theory, uh, by the way, that earth, air, fire and water are primary to the world is I think the longest surviving uh, philosophical uh, um, or scientific theory. It starts in the 5th century BCE and it's still going at the time of Milton. Uh, so 2,000 years for earth, air, fire and water. Uh, Empedocles calls these four primary beings roots. Soon these same roots were given the name elements. Uh, Greek word is stoicheia a term which is also a metaphor for the world's basic physical components, taken from the Greek word for the letters of the alphabet. Seeds, say matter, or beginnings, archai, were other metaphors that early cosmologists drew upon to try to capture a notion like our everyday idea of basic matter in ordinary speech. The point to emphasize here is that matter signifying the world's physical foundations, was and always has been a metaphor, a theoretical notion lacking any fixed empirical reference in itself. Hence, we're able to keep using the term even when our scientific models have completely changed. You may care to reflect on the checkered history of modern attempts to give a final description to matter, the periodic table of elements, protons, neutrons and electrons, quarks, strings and so forth. Plotinus was familiar with the four Empedoclean elements and also with the atoms of Democritus and Epicurus. From our modern perspective, these theories, especially Epicurean atomism, are among the most important antecedents of early European science with its understanding of matter as the ultimate physical makeup of everything. And that's because elements and atoms were theoretical notions that envisioned the world's foundations in discrete corpuscular or what we call material terms. Plotinus, however, totally rejected corpuscular theories of ultimate matter. His cosmology, like the cosmology of Plato, Aristotle and Stoic philosophers, invokes reason, structure and design as the primary factors explaining the way the world is perceived to function. Unlike modern bottom-up material models of explanation, with the world conceived as evolving from simpler to more complex states, from the Big Bang, which produces two elements only to start with, hydrogen and helium, and then uh, goes on, producing more and more different things. Uh, unlike that kind of model, Plotinus's philosophical ancestors largely proceeded by my means of what I'll call a top-down explanatory model. On their view, Ultimate matter doesn't evolve under its own causal power into derivative elements and life types. Rather, matter is taken to be the recipient of pre-existing forms or formative principles. And it's they, commonly called logoi, also translatable as formulae, that energize and characterize matter. Thus, in Aristotle's, of course, unfortunate understanding of sexual reproduction, it's the male parent's sperm that end endows uterine matter with specific animal form. The, the uterine matter is simply understood as a recipient and not actually contributing to the form of the uh, offspring. Plotinus starts his essay on matter by stating what he takes to be the shared view of Platonists, Aristotelians, and Stoics. And this is the first passage on the handout. All who theorize about so-called matter agree 
in describing it as a certain, and we have to have a few technical terms, substrate, Greek word, hypokamenon, and receptacle, hypodoche, of forms, ade. They all agree about that, but they dis disagree as to what the substrate nature is and of how and what it is receptive. To unpack this difficult sentence, I need to clarify the words substrate, receptacle, and forms. All three of these terms are basic to Plotinus' own understanding of matter. Now, the first thing to note in text one, which may seem very surprising, is the absence of any physical determinacy from this preliminary account of matter. Plotinus doesn't say that all who theorize about so-called matter say that it's some kind of a body. He doesn't say that. As he continues, he does state that some of those who share the subject, substrate and receptacle theory, he means Stoic philosophers, do attribute body uh, to matter, whereas other philosophers, he says, Platonists and Aristotelians, take matter as such to be bodiless. However, the Stoic's bodily matter is not an empirical entity, but what we might call theoretical plasticine. Look at text two. What underlies everything that has qualities is matter, which is the prime substance, Greek word usia, of all things, or their most primitive basis. In this case, he does call it a, bo a body without appearance by its own nature and without form. Here we can see how stoic matter, uh, bodily though it is, fits Plotinus' generic description of matter as a substrate, an underlying something or other, and receptacle of forms, a foundation of reality that's completely inert and amorphous. Substrate, in Greek, hypokamenon, is an Aristotelian word. Plotinus explains the term as follows, this text three. About the receptacle of bodies, okay, let it be said that there must be something underlying bodies which is different from the bodies themselves, as is made clear by the changing of the elements into one another. There's a change from one form into another form, and so there remains that which has received the form of the engendered thing and lost the other one. <coughs> The remaining item, what receives the form and persists through the change, is matter in the sense of substrate. Plotinus exemplifies this notion by reference to metallurgy, making a cup out of gold and then smelting it down again. The cup comes to be and ceases to be, while the gold of which it's made persists. The gold as substrate for the cup exemplifies the proximate matter that ordinary objects are made of. Proximate matter explains how ordinary objects move and change while also retaining their basic physical identity. Well, by ordinary objects, I mean living beings or artificial things like uh, uh, cups. So there, there we're just talking about ordinary objects. But what are we to say about ultimate matter? Is there a persisting and ultimate substrate for everything? This question brings us to Plotinus' other term for matter, hypodoche, receptacle. Plato took this metaphor from Plato, Plotinus. Uh, here's a portion of what Plato says about the receptacle in text four. That nature which receives all the bodies, has never in any way whatever taken on any characteristics similar to any of the things that enter it. That's why we shouldn't call the mother or receptacle of what's come to be and of what is perceptible, either earth or air, fire or water, or any of their compounds and their constituents. But if we speak of it as an invisible, and characterless sort of thing, one that receives all things and shares in a most perplexing way in what's intelligible, a thing extremely difficult to comprehend. 
we shall not be misled. So here's Plato putting forward this receptacle theory and telling us that he has huge difficulty in trying to characterize and describe this amorphous foundation, which is somehow underlying everything that we do perceive. He also calls this space as the container of bodies, and therefore conceives of it as extending throughout the physical world. This text, text 4, was foremost in the mind of Plotinus when he attempted to clarify his own notion of ultimate matter. What I've called the Stoic Plasticine notion was also influenced by Plato, uh, but with the difference observed by Plotinus, the Stoic receptacle isn't bodiless, but taken to be a completely formless body. Bodiless container, formless body. These are very obscure notions. What philosophical thoughts are driving them? The answer has two related aspects. One I will call idealist, and the other realist. The idealist aspect is the notion that ordinary things, everything in this room, as it were, derive their identity, quality, and quantity from their forms or structures or intelligible natures, principles that are accessible to the mind. The realist aspect is the evident fact that ordinary objects are composites of a specific form, for instance, cat form, daffodil form, and of that in which the individual instance of that form is expressed or manifested, their matter. And if you find this baffling, is it any more baffling than the notion that you know, this is a piece of wood is a perceptible object, but it's not a perceptible object under the phys physicist's microscope. It's a, an active set of electrons moving around. We don't, we don't see it that way. Ordinary objects are not bodiless containers or amorphous bodies. But in order for them to acquire the specific identity, quantity, and quality they have, they require, according to the theories I'm discussing, a form-containing constituent. So the matter is what underlies the form, or what receives the form, and they enables it to have magnitude. In this analysis, then, form and matter are essentially correlative notions. You can't have one without the other. They're not instantiated independently of each other. Now, this codependence and correlativity fit Aristotle's and the Stoics' accounts of form and matter. When we study natural objects, we can either focus on what they're made of and on what persists throughout their life or existence, their material constituents, or on the forms that the particular things that they are uh, have, cat or tree of a certain size or color. But Platonists, such as Plotinus, see a need to hugely complicate this analysis of form and matter. The complexity arises because in their top-down analysis of reality, the forms that make natural objects, particular cats or trees and so forth, aren't fully and perfectly present in their feline or arboreal matter. The matter of such objects is what makes them physical repositories of non-physical formative principles. Physical objects in Platonism are material copies of immaterial ideal substances. As David Sedley will explain to this institute in his December lecture on Plato's theory of forms. You may care to recall Wordsworth's Shades of the Prison House that turned the light of Plato's forms into the light of common day. The light of common day is what we have in this room. At least we don't have in this room Plato's immaterial ideal substances. For Plotinus, ultimate matter is an insubstantial substrate and receptacle of immaterial formative principles. In what follows, we'll see how he struggles to get this meaning across. 
in a systematic inventory of the perceptible world, this is text five, Plotinus sets out the following terms. Matter, form, composite, that's the mixture of matter and form, simple bodies, composite bodies, accidents and attributes, relation, quantity, quality, and motion. This inventory of originally Aristotelian terms would be quite straightforward. If Plotinus, like Aristotle, had regarded individual things, this tree, this cat, this desk, as the perceptible world's primary beings or independent substances. Instead, as a Platonist, Plotinus treats Fusis, his word for the physical world of natural objects, as the domain of only derivative beings. He even calls natural perceptible objects such as stones, trees, and animals, images, the originals of which are the suprasensible, intelligible forms. While Plotinus is quite ready for right on occasion, as if perceptible things have intrinsic forms and corresponding matter, that's approximate language. The only unequivocal Plotinian beings are purely intelligible and intelligent entities objects and activities of divine thought. Perceptible properties and natures are projections that fall short of full reality. We can now see that Plotinus' two terms for his so-called matter, substrate and receptacle, belong to two rather different earlier theories. One of these the Aristotelian substrate theory is well designed to identify the proximate material of natural or manufactured things such as trees or cups, the wood or the bronze that underlies such forms. Proximate material, however, doesn't account for the nature of matter as such. What's the wood coming from, the bronze coming from. And if you say, well, that's coming from the four elements, well, what are they coming from? How can they be there? So let me repeat. Proximate material doesn't account for the nature of matter as such. And using matter here, if you will, but in a perfectly modern sense, basic physical reality, as it were. The other theory, the platonic receptacle, and its stoic successor, fulfill this latter role of trying to account for basic physical reality by positing a changeless spatial container for all physical objects into which they come and go as they change. Neither of these theories, however, the substrate or the receptacle theory, explains the composition of proximate matter. What makes it brazen? or arboreal, respectively. Nor does either theory fully face the question of why there is a physical world consisting of transient bodies in the first place. A version of the you know, famous question, why is there something rather than nothing? By synthesizing the substrate and the receptacle theories, Plotinus goes some way to answering both these questions. In the process, however, he leaves us with an ultimate matter that is too dark to fully conceptualize. After positing matter as common to all bodies, Plotinus asks, well, can we think of matter just as some kind of generic entity, which just somehow underlies everything and is common to everything? The Stoics had called their plasticine notion of material substrate primary substance, that was in passage two, and so made it generic to everything that exists. Plotinus responds that matter can't be a true genus, meaning some basic category of existence, because it has no essence. It doesn't confer anything substantive on objects. Substance, he argues, must exclusively be a function of form, intelligibility, structure. Try to imagine something that has no form or structure. May we then dispense with ultimate matter and substitute a single genus of what he calls perceptible substance and call it body that's essential and common to all terrestrial things. 
stones, earth, water, plants, and animals. The problem with that proposal for Pinosurges is that bodies aren't uniform. Some are complex and organic. Others, like the four elements, are what he calls more matterish, julicota in Greek, meaning less unitary and less determinate. Bodies, in other words, provide objects with different kinds of proximate matter. Ultimate matter, on this account, is what would be left, left if, contrary to fact, one could separate all form, even the simplest and most primitive form, from perceptible things and physical elements. So let's strip it all away. Strip the, um, the, the skin of the orange, and everything, what would you be left with? Plotinus's notion of ultimate matter seems to face two paradoxes. One, conceptual, and the other, ontological. The conceptual paradox is the indispensability of an essentially imperceptible and indescribable substrate to the analysis of perceptible objects. So we'll see Plotinus trying to explain this in passage 6 on the handout. He says, intellect discovers the doubleness of bodies. It divides until it arrives at something simple that can't be further analysed. But as long as possible, it proceeds into the depth of body. The depth of every body is matter. Therefore, all matter is dark, because the formula... Logos is light. Intellect, too, is a formula. In seeing the formula that is on each thing, intellect takes what's below to be dark because it's beneath the light. It's like the way the eye, whose form is light, when it gazes at the light and at colours, which are lights, states that what lies beneath the colours is dark and material, concealed by the colours. To do philosophical justice to this passage, we need to take light and dark quite literally, though with reference to mental vision. The obvious aspect or component of a body is its perceptible form, shape, ground colour, etc. But bodies also have imperceptible depth. Well, how do we know? We can't see into the depth, can we? How do we know that bodies have imperceptible depth? By analogy, he says, with dark as the absence of light. Plotinus infers that bodies have a dark underside, consisting of the absence of what we can actually perceive of their makeup. Ultimate matter on this account is essentially something that defies description and perception. We know of it only in the way that we know that if we turn off a light, dark supervenes. Dark simply is the absence of light. There's nothing else to it. Plotinus articulates the ontological paradox in the following passage. This is passage 7 on the handout. Matter, he says, is an image and a phantom of bulk. O Greek word for bulk here is onkos. Phantom is phantasma. A striving for substantiality... Now you see how he loves to play with paradox, a stable instability. Matter has no strength, but is lacking in all being. Whatever announcement it makes, therefore, is a lie. And if it appears great, it's small. So here, here the idea is we're trying again to do the impossible. We're trying to kind of isolate matter from form. How could we then say anything about it? And yet somehow we sense that there has to be a matter underlying the form. If it appears great, it's small. If more, it's less. Its apparent being isn't real because the apparent being belongs to the form. It's a sort of fleeting frivolity, he says. Hence the things that seem to come to be in matter are frivolities, nothing but phantoms in a phantom. Like something in a mirror 
which really exists in one place, but is reflected in another. It seems to be filled and holds nothing. It's all seeming. And of course, I'm sure many, many of you can recognize the sort of platonic background of this. Plotinus is, is always, I mean, he's in many ways quite an original thinker, but he doesn't regard himself as an original thinker. He regards himself as an interpreter of Plato, trying to put what is often quite enigmatic in Plato's dialogues into a much more systematic form. So leaving that passage text, as I think. Bulk or solidity is basic to any notion of body. But where do bodies get their bulk from? From their matter, surely. But ultimate matter as such has no real bulk or solidity. Ultimate matter is a mere phantom of bulk. How do we deal with this regress? Does it mean that bulk or mass is in some sense illusory, a mere figment of our imagination? Well, rather than answer that pressing question now, let me just step back and say where I take Plotinus to be coming from in his mystifying statements about ultimate matter. <laughs> Given his Aristotelian background, might we remove suggestions of paradox by interpreting the two quoted passages, six and seven, the one about proceeding into the depth of body and the other one about the phantom mirror, might we remove suggestions of paradox, stable instability and so on, by interpreting these passages as rhetorical rather than doctrinal. Well, Aristotle too, although he does talk about prime matter, he doesn't think it's a sort of thing in itself. It's a kind of purely conceptual or logical notion. For Aristotle, the elementary qualities, hot, cold, wet, and dry, are basic to the simplest instances of Aristotelian matter. For Aristotle, there's nothing, there's nothing further to be gotten beyond, beyond that. There's no such Aristotelian thing as ultimate matter. So may we explain Plotinus correspondingly, as he himself sometimes seems to suggest, that there's really no such thing. Well, only up to a point, I suggest, because ultimate matter, as understood by Plotinus, is absolutely necessary to the nature of the physical world. Remember again, we're talking really about the two worlds here. The, the world of the intellect, the world, as it were, where you try to imagine things independently of their physical embodiment, I think of things formulae and so forth, or the actual physical extended world. So for Plotinus, matter is fundamentally necessary if there's to be a physical world. Ordinary objects, unlike ideal objects, are embodied. Embodiment is a function of ultimate matter as distinct from form. Now we can't get at such matter to examine it in the laboratory because ultimate matter as distinct from proximate matter, you know, the, the wood of the desk, the flesh and bones of the animal, doesn't exist as a separable thing, but it does furnish ordinary objects somehow or other with the basic bodily properties that distinguish them from the ideal objects of thought. In other words, such properties as spatial extension, changeableness, multiplicity, impermanence, and, well, a bit more about that in a moment, imperfection. Plotinus also differs profoundly from Aristotle in crediting ultimate matter with supreme negative value. Now, scholars often like to say that for Plotinus, matter is a principle of evil. And here let me just say in parenthesis that while Plotinus is too complex and uh, capacious, you know, just to make broad, broad generalizations about, I don't think he has a, anything like a principle of evil if we think of what a, a principle of evil would be in something like Augustinian terms. Augustine, of course, knew Plotinus. He knew him through, through Latin. But when Plotinus talks about the badness of matter, he's not, he's not talking about anything to do with morality or uh, the, f the human fall or something like that. What Plotinus means when he talks about the badness of matter is that ultimate matter negates the supreme positive value he attributes to determinate unity, identity, and intelligibility. What makes ultimate matter bad for Plotinus is its illusory phantom-like quality, 
It's lack of stability, determinacy. Badness is a function of lack. Plotinus also differs from Aristotle in the way he distinguishes between intelligible, proximate, and ultimate matter. All three of these types of matter satisfy being a substrate and receptacle. But they fit the idea in the distinct ways that correspond to his overall metaphysical scheme. So I'm going to be talking uh, uh, about the sort of these notions that you find in my text eight, where I've tried to set out the overall kind of way in which Plotinus thinks about reality. So, headed by what I've called here, following Plotinus, the transcendent one, so those are the kind of bold um, words on the left hand part of that handout, Plotinus' philosophy involves a sort of vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. The horizontal dimension has three aspects, ontological, physical, cognitive, how we understand something, and the value of something. The vertical dimension has five levels, ranging from the one, that's this notion of this ultimate transcendent unity, God, the good, which he thinks is really the source of everything, right down to ultimate matter, which is the shadowy domain at the bottom. And I've represented that scheme, as you can see, on my handout. Now, don't worry about some of the details there, just as there, if we should want to talk about it later in the discussion. We don't need all the details, I think, for trying to get clear about ultimate matter. But just let me say the following. According to this scheme, uh, the, way, the reality of something, the way we understand something, its value, called the ontological, the cognitive and the value, they're so related that unity and stability are their common measure at the top and complete privation of stability and determinacy are their common measure at the bottom as signified by ultimate matter. So Plotinus' scheme states this, that as things or levels become less unitary and stable, they become less real, less accessible to our understanding and less good. This scheme is an obvious successor to Plato's famous sun, line, and cave analogies. You remember how Plotinus imagines the sort of uneducated uh, human condition as uh, ima imagine as human beings sitting in a, a dark cave where, where there's a fire which is um, uh, in a shadowy way illuminating objects that are being carried behind the fire so they're sort of uh, their, their shadows are shown up on the wall uh, where the prisoners are facing and then he imagines how uh, if somebody were to be uh, released from this prison status they would be totally baffled at first because they, they would think the reality was the shadow world and then you remember how Plato then develops that complex story uh, in order to try to show us how the everyday world is a shadowy world compared to the clarity that we could uh, understand through um, philosophy and mathematics. Plato presupposes the existence of bodies and the inferior status of bodies as perceptible, non-knowable, changeable items. But he doesn't clearly explain why there are bodies in the first place. In Plotinus, uh, we have uh, the idea of the soul, which is the, in the middle of this scheme I put on text 8, as somehow projecting onto matter images of the ideal uh, intelligible entities. I'll try to put that on the handout. In other words, you could say ultimate matter for Plotinus is the wall of Plato's cave, distorting true ideas by reflecting imperfect images of them. So the physical world, according to Plotinus, is an inferior embodied counterpart to the purely intelligible and immaterial forms. Now be careful, this secondary status doesn't make the physical world unreal or bad. 
Plotinus takes the physical world to be a sort of trickle-down product of intelligible forms. And as good as it can be, relative to its being an image rather than the ultimate reality. But its contents, owing to their embodiment and matter, lack the unity and stability of the intelligible forms. Now we may find it, why, why we might feel, well, uh, a world of complete unity and stability would be a very boring world. But if we think of, try to think of uh, where Plato and Plotinus are coming from, if we think that there could, there could really be nothing better than thinking you've totally understood something. I mean, the kind of aha, Leibniz, that, that notion that somebody has, you know, when they prove a mathematical theorem, then we can understand why you might think that the, uh, the absolutely secure, wonderful clarity of that mathematical proof has something special about it which the everyday perceptible world cannot quite share. So human beings for Plotinus, we human beings, we, we, we are kind of, he says, we are amphibious. We, can, we live in two worlds. We, we live in both a world of thought and a world of embodiment and perception. And in a way, we human beings for Plotinus create the physical world by projecting our own images of things onto matter. So what can we say about matter for Plotinus? When we try to think about it, to try to get clear about it, if we can get clear about something so obscure, when we go below the level of saying, well, the wood or the bronze or the, or the metal, uh, we, when we get below that level, what can we say of anything? So this is the last part of my talk. Plotinus starts his account of ultimate matter by reaffirming its complete tractability an inherent lack of quality and quantity. So he asks, well, where does matter get its color, temperature, weight, size, and shape from? Well, not from itself, evidently, but this is text nine. He says, matter acquires qualities, not from itself, but from the giver of shape and size that supplies everything, as it were, from the realities, those realities being these formative transcendent principles. If the maker, he says, is prior to matter, matter will be just as the maker wants it to be, accommodating to everything, including size. The form supplies matter with everything that goes with and is caused by the rational principle or the formative principle. How are we to understand the expressions, the giver of shape and size and the will of the maker? The answer supplied by the text is form in the sense, I think, of formative principle. What do we mean by formative principle? Well, an analogy might be DNA, digital information, encoded algorithms. If we think of the ki these kinds of um, notions, the things that are what gives structure and um, intelligibility to the physical world. In Plotinus' account, those don't simply float down, as it were, to matter from the intelligible noose. They're mediated to matter. They're projected onto it, as I was just saying, by soul, where soul is both our own individual ways of looking at the world and also what he calls the world soul, which is the kind of general principle of life, which gives life and nature to things. But what, so, okay. So what does he say, mean when he says that uh, the, my, the maker supplies the matter with, with the forms and, um, and everything that goes with it? Go to the next passage, if you would. Uh, this is number 10 on the handout. He says there, matter as such simply lacks size, but the formative principle gave it a size that was previously absent. Again. What, how are we to make sense of that notion, uh, giving it a size? He says we have to invoke something about our own capacity as human beings to think of things that are indefinite. And by way of clarification for that, Plotinus first repeats his earlier assertion about the way the eye, in the absence of color, can be said in a way to be affected by the dark. 
But we might say, is that really seen? Are you, when you are literally in the absence of all light, is there something to see? Well, he says, it can only be described as seeing if the eye doesn't see nothing in that condition, but it sees the absence of everything visible. So he says in text 11, when the soul thinks nothing, it experiences nothing. But when it thinks matter, it has the experience of an impression, as it were, of the formless. So it's, again, it's not that there's nothing there at all, but the only way we can uh, think of it is to think of it as something which is amorphous, formless. During normal perceptual consciousness, the soul thinks its perceptual objects in terms of their shape, size, and so forth, for Tatinus, in terms of their perceptible forms, the golden cup and so forth. The soul can recognize these things easily enough, he thinks, because we have the rational faculty and the corresponding concepts. But when it comes to thinking of trying to think of matter as such, ultimate matter, the soul arrives at an impasse. And it brings us back to those two paradoxes I brought up earlier. One is called the ontological and the conceptual. To continue with Plotinus' own words, text 5. Having abstracted and removed everything in the whole composite item. So this is what I was sort of talking about before when I imagined the orange. You take off the, the outer uh, skin, the outer the, the pith, and so forth. So, it, removing everything. The soul, he says, thinks this non-rational residue and thinks it non-thinkingly. And since matter doesn't remain amorphous, but is shaped in things, the soul thrusts on it the forms of things from distress at the indefiniteness, as if it were afraid of being outside of beings and couldn't bear to spend any time on that which is not. And here, I suppose, you know, you know we can all think of our own analogies, more modern analogies for uh, what Plotinus is, is doing here. You can think of a movie like The Matrix, you can think of simply being in outer space where there's no illumination at all. It's not that there's nothing there, but there's nothing that you can be aware of. There's nothing that impinges on your sensibility. Is that what matter is really like? The soul, he says, cannot accept a representation of absolute indefiniteness. It doesn't mean that there isn't such a thing as a void, but we can't accept it. So we always put some form, however minimal, on matter. Can ultimate matter then, in view of its elusive and illusory status, be an objective constituent of the physical world? Can we still say that well, there's something there? Bodies may be thought to need bulk or mass in order to receive magnitude and quality. But since ultimate matter has no magnitude, how can it provide bulk or mass? And at this point, Plotinus, for the first time in his essay, seems to assign a positive attribute to ultimate matter. This is text 13. Drawing on his original description of matter as an incorporeal substrate, which we started from, he says in text 13, uh, matter has no inherent size or bulk or bodiless, but it accepts what it receives in extension because it's receptive of extension. Is ultimate matter just empty space? Well, that description could fit, uh, that suggestion could fit its description as pure recipient and substrate. We've seen that Plato, in fact, had described his very peculiar receptacle. One of his descriptions for it was space. But ultimate matter cannot be empty, not space in our sense of the term, which is an objective designation after all. We, we can and do send uh, spaceships out into space. So something is there. How, moreover, could empty space endow bodies with mass? The indefiniteness of ultimate matter, he says, gives it its capacity to receive the forms of bodies in extension. Otherwise, if matter had its own magnitude, it would impose that magnitude on the forms it receives. So this is bringing it back very much to 
points I was raising at the beginning of the talk. If there is something we call ultimate matter, then it, it couldn't surely be something of determinate shape and size because then it wouldn't be ultimate matter. By its reception of bodily forms, matter becomes mass, or at least we imagine it so. When the forms of things that are naturally embodied encounter ultimate matter, they cause matter to acquire the magnitude appropriate to their bodies. But as such, ultimate matter is, he says, always sheer void, an illusion of mass, incapable of being credited with any size of its own. Ultimate matter, he says, is a privation, this Greek word steresis, the opposite of form, has no form. It's knowable or thinkable only by what it is not, and not by it's something that it is, because it has no definite identity. And it's unavoidably dark, then, in a metaphysical scheme of Plotinus's that posits that things can only really exist insofar as they are intelligible and clear, and matter is not intelligible or clear. Rather than shirk this conclusion, Plotinus revels in it as the following dizzying passage exemplifies. This is text 14, the last one in the handout. Since matter is nothing in itself except what it is by being matter, it is not in actuality. For if it's going to be something in actuality, it will be that thing in actuality and not be matter. So it wouldn't be matter absolutely. It would only be proximate matter, only in the way that bronze is. So it, it is in actuality an illusion, phantasma. In actuality, a falsehood. Therefore, if it must be, it must not be in actuality. So that in departure from true being, it may have its being in non-being. <coughs> Plotinian matter is neither nothing nor something. He can call it a phantom, a mirage, a privation, but even these characterizations are meaningful only by courtesy of what matter actually lacks, namely, any kind of form or describable or intelligible reality. In light of his Aristotelian inheritance, why didn't Plotinus take ultimate matter to be just, just an idea, something we can try to sort of play around with in a talk like this, but not uh, accord it any kind of independent uh, uh, reality at all. There are many possible answers, I think, to this question. I'll just offer you two here. Uh, we stop it. Plotinus, the Platonist, cannot avail himself of the robust Aristotelian notion that embodied beings this cat, this tree, are basic substances. Embodied beings, for a Platonist, can only be quasi-real. They're shadowy reflections of intelligible forms. The least real aspect of them, as it were, or the, the most unreal aspect of them, is their bodiliness. Bodies require matter in order to be bodies, meaning occupants of space. But this material consistency deprives them of any claim to be unequivocal substances. Rather than underpinning the firm existence of bodies, matter, on this view, accounts for bodies' impermanence and changeableness, and so prevents their being full-fledged entities. My second rejoinder is to propose that Plotinian matter brings him quite close to George Berkeley, we call him Berkeley there, where I live, but we, his, he, we should say Berkeley, quite close to Berkeley's notorious doctrine that material substance is a self-contradictory or meaningless term of which there can be no idea, says Berkeley, and no knowledge. Recall what Plotinus says concerning the soul's vain attempts to achieve a positive and intelligible representation of matter. What our individual souls or minds can actually think or perceive, and it seems to me this is absolutely correct, is the, is the formed aspect. We don't see the material aspect of bodies. We always see them in terms of their having some shape, size, or whatever it was. I mean, Berkeley's great argument 
as to why matter as such is an illusory or contradictory notion is that we cannot experience matter. We can, only, we can see things, we can hear things, we can smell them, we can touch them, and we can hear them. No, but we, but we, matter as such is not something to be sensed like that. And in this sense, I think Plotinus anticipated Barker hugely. He presumes that there's more to perceptual things than we can perceive of them. In that sense, he doesn't reject the notion of matter altogether like Barclay. But this more that things have of, in matter is such a strange sense of more that it's tantamount, as he repeatedly says, to indefiniteness or non-being. So the perceptible form matter compounds that he takes ordinary bodies to be aren't really out there. They are in the soul because, as he sometimes says, soul is not in body, but body is in soul. This dependence of body on soul also anticipates Barclay's rejection of a mind-independent world of material things. Plotinus verbally agrees with Aristotle that perceptible objects are composites of matter and form or substrate and qualities. Yet for Plotinus, the matter taken by itself isn't even a potential being, but an actual non-being, an amorphous receptacle that contributes nothing except receptivity to the forms and qualities constitutive of bodies. Matter as such is a non-entity. That's what's the matter with it. To return to our modern physicist's dark matter, are we to speculate that what is so called will eventually become clear to the eye of experimental reason? Or may it be the case that science is running out of resources to provide a fully intelligible account of what we have traditionally taken to be out there? If Plotinus has any cognitive relevance to physics, it won't be thanks to a resurgence of Platonic metaphysics, I suppose, but to the challenge he presents, like Berkeley, to our capacity to conceptualize a completely mindless physical 